Hi guys, so I will be meeting all of you very shortly um, and getting to know you, but um, I wanted to introduce this lecture here and get it up for you guys. Um, I do have a lot of content already um, recorded, and so um, a lot of that content will be going up shortly. If you do see some older content, I have taught it online a couple times now. Um, some of the older videos are not as good of quality um, and might have a watermark like Screencast-O-Matic down here on the bottom left. Um, that will disappear as the course goes on. Um, but the PowerPoints are always on the Google Shared folder. So um, if you ever are not like getting a piece of information because of the watermark, um, you can go and reference that PowerPoint. Um, but I will be going over a lot of different topics and ideas um, in these presentations. Let me know if they glitch out or have any issues. Uh, otherwise, we can get started here. So in these couple of sets of videos, which aren't too long, uh, you sort of get an overall idea of art up to modern art. So for those of you who've taken art history and some other art history classes, this is kind of a refresher. Um, we don't really teach art history the same way we used to at Maya, which is good. Um, it's good to change things, um, but then it sometimes loses some of its chronology. And so I wanted to remind you guys of some of the paintings that exist and occur before the modern art period so that you have some sort of history um, to think about as we move into talking about modernism next week and really delving into some of those ideas. So that's what a lot of these um, videos are about. So reintroducing those ideas um, about modern art um, or pre-modern art. Um, and then in the next two weeks, we'll be delving into these sort of artistic periods and breaking down sort of how we understand and contemplate modern art as well. So that is an overview. I am so excited to teach this class um, and to have some new experiences and conversations about these works. So um, I will talk to all of you guys next week. So we're going to talk a little bit about um, an overview of modern art and how we get there. So hopefully you've had some sort of um, slight introduction to art history and the study of art. Um, and I'm going to give you a little bit of knowledge so that you don't feel like we're sort of jumping into the 1850s without any sort of background that you would have in the class. So um, we'll be talking, obviously, about modern art in more detail next week and really talking about the origin of modern art, but this is sort of just an introduction um, to the class. Uh, make sure that you're taking notes and whatnot because you will be getting uh, tested in exams um, on these um, ideas eventually. So how do we get there art historically? Why is it important, um, AKA art historical periods that come before this? So I will be posting a document on Canvas that outlines um, art historical periods, I think like from the Renaissance and beyond, maybe even before that, just to give you a sort of outline of um, artistic periods, styles, what people are looking at in art history before this, etc. Um, it's very, very general. It's just sort of an overview if you feel like you're kind of lost to look at that and sort of um, try to remember or um, look over and um, make sure you have some sort of general information about those periods. So just sort of for your knowledge, I'll have that on Canvas. Um, so these are some of the artistic periods that come before these would be covered in that um, document. But we're really going to be looking at neoclassical art as well as romanticism here very briefly. Um, and then realism will be next week. So um, we'll be talking about realism as part of the start of modern art next week. Um, but really just going to focus in here on neoclassicism and romanticism just to give you this background, like I said. So neoclassical art... Um, is the response to Rococo art in France. We're going to see a lot of um, modern art occur in France as well, and then we'll see it move out of France and into America sort of around World War II, and we'll talk about um, why that move um, in art occurs. So if you've ever seen Rococo art, it's very frilly, it's very luxurious, very much of the aristocracy and the monarchy at the time in France. So French Rococo art is this very frilly, sort of beautiful imagery that we see, um, and neoclassical art is very much going to be the rejection of Rococo artistic traditions, and this is going to be because of the French Revolution. So with the French Revolution, you have the overthrow of Marie Antoinette and her husband, 
um, King Louis, and they're going to be beheaded. And we have um, Napoleon coming in and taking over um, and trying to develop sort of this republic um, in France. And obviously we're going to see like two or three different French revolutions um, over the course um, of this time period, and we're really not going to talk about them because they don't apply necessarily to um, modern art. But um, this is what really inspires the move to neoclassical art of the time period. So um, this becomes, neoclassical art becomes the art of the French Revolution. We see them move back to classical antiquity, to Greek and Roman ideals, and the traditions of liberty, civil virtue, morality, and political upheaval. So for example, you have Jacques-Louis David. He produces this image of Napoleon crossing the St. Bernard, 1800 to 1801. Uh, and you have this really gorgeous sort of classical example of Napoleon going up the Alps in this very classical scene of him pointing with this great luxurious drapery and the very clear distinction of him and the horse and his soldiers in the background. So even though he crossed the Alps on a donkey, um, and it wasn't sort of as glamorous as this image sort of portrays. Um, that is sort of the neoclassical ideal that's portrayed by David uh, in this work. If you've seen this work before, you may have seen it in Kahinda Wiley's painting. Uh, Kahinda Wiley takes these sort of classical portraits and reestablishes them uh, with black figures or figures that haven't been represented historically in paintings and so here I've given you an example of that um, Napoleon leading the army over the Alps 2005 um, Kahinda Wiley sort of retaking that image um, of Napoleon um, and reframing it with a different figure okay Kahinda Wiley was really renowned for this. Here's Napoleon um, on the right and then Ice-T in his place on the left. Um, hopefully to some extent we'll get to Kahinda Wiley and we'll talk about him when we get to Gauguin too because he's just had this great exhibition where he talks about Gauguin as a painter. So I'll sort of try to insert um, little bits of contemporary art as well to sort of connect you um, with how people sort of respond to um, modern art or pre-modern art um, in a contemporary period. So here's some more works by Kahinda Wiley as well. Jacques-Louis David, who painted Napoleon, is also going to paint images of the revolution as well. So he kind of vacillates between both sides, depending on who he can make money through, which is sort of um, interestingly tragic. Um, but here I have um, The Death of Marat, uh, 1793, by Jacques-Louis David. Um, this is an image of, one of the most famous images of the French Revolution with the murder of Jean-Paul Marat, who was a French revolutionary um, and leader. And um, he's going to have a different faction of the revolution come in and murder him, um, Charlotte Corday. And um, he spent a lot of time in the bathtub because he had a skin condition. Um, and so she, she assassinates him in the bathtub. So this is that moment where he's writing a letter, he's in his bathtub, um, and he is murdered. And he sort of slumps over the side of his bathtub. So it's a very classical image in that um, we are depicting this sort of tragic moment of death. You have this gravestone um, and this clarity of the image. Um, and it's what's really interesting is that you also have all this blank space that really sort of pens up the drama of this sort of neoclassical piece. Um, but here we have another example of Jacques-Louis David, um, and he paints quite a bit during this time. We're also going to see a lot of different interesting um, artistic paintings at this time, like this one by Ang. Um, which is sort of the neoclassical move into romanticism. So some people call this piece neoclassical, others romantic. Um, but here we have the depiction of a quote unquote foreign woman um, who is idealized. She's very classical looking. Um, she has very a graceful body, um, but you still have sort of this elongated torso that's very sexual and slinky, um, as well as for these exotic, um, objects, right? An exotic being um, 
slightly a strange term to use, but um, you have this fan and um, the different garments and things that she's wearing. So um, even though she's sort of in incorrectly made, um, her body is not proportionally correct. It's supposed to look very aesthetically beautiful and sexual. So um, her paint, this painting is really interesting by Aang um, because it's the work that's used in the Gorilla Girls when they talk about sort of um, nudity of women in museums. So she sort of uses the example of that, but she's this sort of very neoclassical slash romantic view of women um, at the time. So with the move um, on from Aang, we move into Romanticism. This is going to really flower during the royal restoration of the monarchy in 1815 to 1830. Uh, it's going to be a reaction against neoclassical ideas, um, moving more towards the universal to the personal, thought towards feeling. So freedom through imagination um, rather than reason. So very much sort of based in your feelings, emotions, dreams, etc. Um, what we're going to see also is this word sublime, which is all mixed with terror, um, very much based in sort of fantasy, uh, in that things are interesting and make you shocked, but they could be ghoulish and infernal and terrible and nightmarish. So um, I will point out the sublime when we look at that in some works. Henry Bile is going to write, Romanticism in all arts is what represents the men of today and not the men of those remote heroic times, which probably never existed anyway. So very much so a rejection um, of the classical ideas from previously um, into this romantic period. So we're going to see more loose and fluid brushwork, strong use of colors, complex and off-balance compositions, uh, powerful contrasts of light and dark, as well as expressive poses and gestures. So the first example of this is Theo Theod Theodore Jericholt in The Raft of the Medusa, which is a very famous work um, of the Romantics from 1818 to 1819. And what we're going to see in Jericholt is that he's actually representing um, a contemporaneous event. So this is not something we necessarily see um, in neoclassicism because they are representing uh, classical ideas and classical stories to represent um, metaphorically current events. So in the Romantic period, we'll see a more move towards um, the representation of contemporary events to um, the painter. So for example, um, this particular work was a shipwreck off the African coast um, by the French frigate Medusa in 1816. And the French um, colonists were headed for Senegal, uh, but their captain ran the boat against a reef. And what ended up happening was there is insufficient lifeboats and um, the captain and officers ran off in these boats and 152 passengers had to make um, a raft of their own from pieces of the ship. So that's what's represented here in the raft of the Medusa. And um, these 152 passengers, um, only uh, 15 are going to survive over a course of 13 days. So, and they even survived sort of at the end um, by eating each other and cannibalism and these really sort of grotesque um, moments. So here he represents this really interesting um, romantic look at that um, event. So for example, um, something that's going to be interesting about Jericholt is that he is going to go to great lengths to represent this event realistically. So he's going to go look at morgues. He's going to talk to people who survived the event to really um, get an idea of what this event would have looked like to capture um, the sort of raw motion. So in this work, he captured this emotion and chaos and horror of that event in this painting. So you have this sort of dead and dying drifting off the raft here. You have this very sort of romantic, um, dramatic, oops, uh, dramatic diagonal of the composition. Um, you have tenebrism, which means this sort of dark to light shading, as well as um, painterly brush strokes. So again, this is not necessarily romantic in that it's sexually romantic or that it shows a couple. Um, it's romantic in the view of their emotions and the feelings that you're supposed to get from this crew and sort of the desperation that they have with these bodies sort of slung over um, and the sort of despair that comes over their faces. And what you're also supposed to see in this particular moment is the figure up here um, on the right. And he's going to be a representation 
um, of an African man here. Um, Jericho was very much in support of the freeing of slaves in Europe, uh, and so he is going to represent um, a black soldier calling out for help. So in every other section, you have sort of despair and sadness um, with this slight bit of hope with the potential for this to be this little ship um, that he's calling to um, way back in the background. It was also very controversial at the time because it was this huge piece showing a contemporary event, which is much more well known for um, historic paintings and classical paintings like the neoclassical period. Um, and so he's going to cause a bit of controversy in the salon. And we're going to talk about the salon culture in France and England. Um, but it was very much the part, the center of art and who decided um, what art was good and what art was bad, and they had sort of a monopoly on public taste and patronage. So very much so sort of juries control um, what's allowed in salons and what's represented as interesting, sort of the masters of taste. And um, the Medusa here, is it represented in a salon here, um, is very much going to be sort of controversial for being this romantic painting um, of a contemporary event. So we're going to talk about the Salon a lot over the course of the semester, so I'll reintroduce the idea um, and its connection to modern art soon. Another romantic painting, this is by Eugene Delacroix, uh, Liberty Leading the People from 1830. Um, this image may be sort of um, familiar and we'll talk about that in a little bit, um, but this is a romantic image of France after the fall of Napoleon. He's defeated in 1815, um, and then the monarchy is placed under Louis the 18th. Um, but we're gonna have um, a lot of censorship and the limit of voting rights, and so we're gonna have an uprising in July of 1830 for three days to sort of overthrow the monarchy. Um, the revolutionaries were students, craft workers, day laborers, um, etc. And so um, Delacroix is gonna represent um, that image here in Liberty Leading the People. So we have this very romantic image. Um, liberty is not a real person. She's an allegory for freedom and liberty uh, carrying the French flag. And um, this image is sort of trampling over the bodies um, to victory. So you have all these figures and the child um, sort of moving to um, get their freedom. So very this sort of very romantic image of feelings and emotions in this time period. It's also great to look over here um, and we have the uh, representation of Notre Dame which is really pretty sad with the burning of Notre Dame recently. Um, I just wanted to point that out as sort of a matter of sadness um, and represented here in that image. So um, with Liberty leading the people um, and moving this banner forward, we have again another contemporary event. So um, Delacroix is again representing a contemporary event to his time period um, in this painting. You will see um, some of these people wearing caps, such as Liberty. Um, it's kind of hard to see because it's a little dark um, in um, images online, but uh, she's wearing this hat of the revolutionaries, and if this seems semi-familiar, hopefully it does. Um, if you like movies and musicals, um, it's very much uh, the revolution that's depicted in Les Mis. So if um, you've seen that before, um, here it is. Uh, if you haven't seen it here before, you've probably seen it um, in Viva La Vida by Coldplay. So they use it in their work as well. Um, we'll see the repurpose of art in um, album covers all the time. We're also going to see romanticism in Spain. We don't get to talk about Francisco Goya a lot, but he's a really phenomenal um, romantic painter. Here he has an image of the family of Charles IV from 1800 oil on canvas. He was a court painter for a long time um, and represented the royal family. And here he is reflecting on Las Meninas by Diego Velázquez, if you've seen this work before, very famous, um, from 1865, in that Diego Velázquez pa uh, paints himself painting this painting, um, which Goya will do here as well. And However, what's sort of interesting inherently about this painting is the representation of the royal family. And um, he very much painted them in the nature that they were. So you have 
um, the woman looking off to the background. Um, people sort of look distracted. They're painted in this hall with great paintings, but it doesn't look like they're paying much attention. Um, there's sort of this um, realistic depiction of the royals. So um, there's uh, a quote here I have about Goya. Um, he made his subject matters look ridiculous. The bloated and dazed king, chest full of meals, standing before another relative um, who appears to have seen a ghost. Uh, this woman right here. Double-chinned queen who stares out. Uh, and she was having an open affair with the prime minister. Her eldest daughter to the left stares into space next to another older relative who seems quizzically surprised by the attention. So even though the family was very satisfied with this painting, it became known as a romantic painting because he portrayed them in sort of such, um, being such real people, which is really not how you represented um, the monarchy at the time. They always wanted to be idealized, um, to look beautiful, to look um, perfect, and this is where Goya is going to sort of um, move away from that ideal. I am going to skip over this other work, I think. The last romantic work, work we're going to look at um, is uh, Turner's work, The Slave Ship. Um, another work of romanticism that was very much, um, we're going to see him part of the Industrial Revolution. He's a famous landscape painter. Um, but here you have a turbulent um, sea scene. It's very passion, energetic. Um, sublime, again, um, awe and suddenness mixed with terror, very much seen um, in um, Jericholt's representation of the slave ship. And so here in this image, we have, again, a contemporary event um, in 1983 um, that was reported. And there was a captain of a slave ship, which you can see back here, um, who, on realizing his insurance company would reimburse him only for slaves lost at sea, but not those who died en route, um, ordered the sick and dying slaves to be thrown overboard. So this was an, actually an event that really jump-started um, the move for the abolition of slavery um, in France, in Europe, because of how poorly slaves were treated on this tr uh, slave vessel. So um, the slave ship owner is going to realize that all his slaves are sickly, that he's not going to get all the money um, that he wants for them. And so what he is going to do is he's going to throw the body of dying slaves off of his ship. And so his ship is seen in the background. And you can see this tiny detail um, of um, the hands as they try to lift up um, to the sky to be saved. And um, the issue again with throwing slaves off this boat was that they were all chained together and so one after another um, sort of uh, were pulled off of the ship. So it's this very tragic moment. Um, and the slave owners are not going to get any money because um, the government and the insurance company is going to realize what they have done. Um, and so it really was this emotive scene that he painted and then sort of changed um, how people looked at the slave trade. So why is it important to study this and to think about this sort of um, before the modern period? The birth of modern art is really going to be much different than what we've seen up to this time period um, with Romanticism. And again, we'll be talking about this at much greater length next week. Um, but Manet and the Impressionists are really going to be considered the founders of modern art in the 60s. Um, realism sort of teetering on the edge there in the 50s and it'll last about 100 years. So um, sometimes people say that 70s considered contemporary art. It sort of depends on who you ask. Um, but instead of the rejection um, from one art period to another, so Rococo is the rejection of neoclassical, neoclassical is the rejection of romanticism, um, or Romanticism is the rejection of neoclassical, um, we're going to see very different innovations happening um, as well. And we're going to see innovations happening in the 1860s and um, very interesting change in how we perceive art. So we're going to talk about that. Um, what we will also see, um, and I want you to be aware of, is that when we think about the past, what produces art? Who commissions art? 
who values art, etc. So before the modern period, we're going to have patrons who commission art. Um, we'll have religion and mythology really dominating the scenes of art, and that is really going to change drastically with modern art. We're going to see urbanization and industrialization, invention of photography, as well as the modernization of life, really change the way that people look at tradition and art and what they want to be represent, what they want to see. Um, so you'll see that people don't want to cater to the desires of the upper middle class and salon culture, and people really change their idea of what they want to see um, in artistic expression. So we'll see that with realism and then um, the impressionists. We're also going to see with the birth of modern art to talk about the term avant-garde, um, which is a term originally used in a military context, uh, designating forward units of advancing arms uh, that said scouted territory, um, which the rest of the troops would soon occupy. So, um, however, we use avant-garde today um, in um, as a term in modern art, designating the forward-looking aspect of modern art and the belief that modernists are working ahead of the public's ability to comprehend. So because modern art was so revolutionary, um, it's developing um, and destroying traditions, um, and their artwork is sort of not accepted right away by the general public or art community, we're really going to see it um, as considered avant-garde. So we'll talk about avant-garde art and what that sort of means. Um, when we look at art, um, you might think about avant-garde as like fashion and Project Runway, right? like things that aren't wearable in sort of day-to-day -day lives, um, very much so the way that we like think about um, modern art as well. And how is modern art different from art that we've seen previously? These are a couple ideas to keep in mind. So new types of art, uh, collage, kinetic art, performance art, land art, we're going to see the use of new materials. So ready-mades and found objects are going to be really popular um, with the Dada movement, and we'll see that in conceptual art. Uh, the expressive use of color, uh, we'll see exploiting color in a major way right off the bat with Impressionism. And then new techniques, so new ways of using new and old materials. So again, um, the different way that we use like oil paint, Impressionism, etc. So when we talk about modern art, um, Sociologist uh, Natalie Hynek uh, draws a distinction between modern and contemporary art, describing them as different paradigms which partially overlap historically. Modern art challenges the, the, challenges the conventions of representation. Contemporary art challenges the very notion of an artwork. So what we're going to see much later sort of in this class period, I'm going to bring this up later, so don't feel like this is like an obscene amount of information you're never going to remember. Um, I'm just trying to give you the basis of how we're going to follow through with this class. So we are going to definitely look at postmodernism, how um, in the 1970s, modern art exhausts itself, um, feels like everything has broken the rules, right? There's no more rules. They can't be broken. Um, everything is a norm breaker. Um, and even the media encourages this in this sort of post-industrial society. So um, I put like a couple videos. I'll throw them on the canvas, on canvas. Um, where Burger King did this whole series of advertisements about breaking the rules, uh, which is pretty funny. Uh, and also, again, we're going to see in the postmodernist world that modern artists are no longer controversial. Picasso, Van Gogh are going to be the most desired art um, at uh, auctions. And then we'll see contemporary art, hopefully by the end of this class, um, people being inspired by their internal, external and external experiences. We're going to see not one single point of view. There's a great diversity in perspectives. We have a pluralistic and globalized society where innovation can happen, uh, as well as pluralism. So we'll talk about this um, much more when we start moving into the 70s because we start to break down how we view um, artistic movements. Um, Within this, we have um, postmodernist questioning, one of the modern's basic notion of whether or not an individual can cre create something original, and you'll see tons of different themes, so identity, body, technology, um, etc. I want you to also know that studying modern art is really important, not only to understanding contemporary art and how we view contemporary art today, um, but modern art is constantly being reused um, in art history um, and in um, 
pop culture, etc. So if you look at something like Anastasia, the film from 97, right, this phenomenal piece of animation, if you've ever seen it, um, I'm going to post this video um, on Canvas in which um, Anastasia, the film, uses like this impressionist, post-impressionist view of Paris um, at this time that this um, movie is being portrayed. It's like the 1900s. Um, anyway, sorry. Um, and you'll see this sort of really intense use of brushwork um, and the way that they reuse modern art in it. So take a look at that. Um, sort of a fun example of modern art. So in um, Intro to Art History 151, usually um, professors talk about sort of what art historians do, right, in discussing kind of how we get to this place historically of discussing art the way that we do. So moving from formal analysis to talking about sort of historical and cultural context of artists um, and sort of studying where um, people come from historically and sort of the culture and interrogating all of these sort of um, larger ideas when it comes to art and art history. The reason I bring this up, um, and hopefully you remember it to some extent, is that when we're talking about art history, a lot of the viewpoints that come um, are from sort of white male critics and art historians. So you have white male art historians encouraging um, the narratives of white male artists. So like Giorgio Vasari, who's a very early sort of art historian slash critic, um, showing the importance and value of someone like Michelangelo. So sort of the larger problem with this, of course, is that um, these white male artists tend to focus specifically on white male, um, or white male art historians focus on these white male artists. And um, so we have this continued dialogue of rejecting people um, who are women, who are BIPOC men and women, and so they're largely left out of the art historical dialogue at large. And so we will be discussing this a lot in modern art because it's an issue um, which you will see probably really easily, and I'll bring it up as well, is that you have all of these white male modern artist geniuses. Um, so we're going to talk about the issues with that um, because they feed into a lot of sort of the problems with modern art dialogue. Um, and it's also important for why um, those artists don't really have a voice um, like these sort of white mi male modern artists do, um, which is important to bring up and kind of discuss at large. I really also want to push this idea of Eurocentrism and ethnocentrism. When we talk about art history, we often talk about Western art history. And this is going to be really visible pretty quick when we talk about modern art because a lot of them are white middle class males that are being sort of the center of art. I hope to insert as many um, women and people of different cultures and different races um, into this work. So keep your eye open. Um, I don't want to focus just on Western art. Um, there are a lot of histories that talk about primitive and other, and we'll even see that in modern art, and we'll sort of address those concerns as well, because primitive is a very sort of negative way to talk about um, a different country's idea and color and what they use in their artistic traditions. And this is sort of a diagram of how you look at um, art history, so. And analyzing a work of art. 